From WRAL News, this is How to Commit Journalism, part of the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network. Each week, we bring you the backstory behind the big story, taking you into our journalistic process here at WRAL News. I'm Ashley Talley, Enterprise Executive Producer at WRAL News. Today, I'm talking with our investigative reporter and data journalist extraordinaire, Tyler Dukes, about a story that he worked on. Um, actually, been working on it for a couple of weeks. Tell me where this started. Yeah, this really started with the New York Times, to be honest. I mean, we we have had here at this station an interest for a long time in this intersection of privacy and public safety. And we've done some stories about how law enforcement has embraced new techniques uh, in our coverage area. But the New York Times in January published this really fascinating piece examining this company called Clearview AI. So they make this facial recognition software that is uh, exclusively marketed towards law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And they sort of broke down um, one of the big findings of this, which is that this company had gone out and scraped and collected 3 billion photos from all of our social media accounts all across the internet uh, to create this really expansive uh, facial recognition application. So they took, basically, if you're on Facebook, they took your photos and put them in this database to which they their program can compare other faces. Absolutely, absolutely. And and that's really significant because when we talk about facial recognition and how facial recognition is trained, how these algorithms are trained, it really depends on the quality of the photos that is going into the system, that are going into the system. That makes sense. So um, the more photos you have, and especially when you've got photos tagged with data like we do with Facebook, like we do with Instagram. We know every person that's tagged with this is Ashley Talley, and you can have a better more reliable face to with which to compare it. Exactly right. Exactly right. And you also have, I think, what's interesting about, you know, grabbing uh, images from social media is that you're not um, grabbing images that are sort of traditional uh, facial recognition photos, which are typically mug shots. And so mm. when you... When or you, maybe driver's license photos. Exactly. They're straight on photos or they're maybe profile photos. They're photos that are in, you know, controlled lighting conditions. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we think about how we, you know, it's photos of us at parties and photos photos of us around the house are candid And shots. maybe turned one way or the mm -hmm. other, which, if you think about it, is the way facial recognition would need to work because you're not going to be looking probably directly at whatever camera they're using with which to compare, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. So, so I mean, isn't this illegal? Absolutely not. Um, you know, wow. and th this is a, it's a really fascinating question that I think the New York Times did a really great job exploring is that, you know, the ability to go out and capture this stuff. And what we're really talking about here is the is the photos from social media accounts that are public, mm -hmm. right? So if you've ever had a, a photo published to a social media account, whether it's your account or not, mm -hmm. um, you know, essentially, ostensibly, it is in this database now. You could not even be on Facebook, Twitter, Insta, whatever. It, it might be your mom. Right. It might be your friend. It might be, you know, and, right. and they may have tagged you or, or, or said your name in it. Um, I think, it, you know, what the big controversy here is, is that there's the technique of going out and just grabbing these photos, right? That's not terribly new. But, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, you know, I think it's been uh, generally frowned upon. You know, this is just something that no one has done yet. Because certainly Facebook could have done it, right? I mean, they have all these images. Sure. Absolutely. But... And we and we actually see facial uh, facial recognition software employed within Facebook's own uh, uh, site. I mean, we see that every time, you know, we load a picture and it says, would you like to you tag? Know, would you like to tag Ashley Tyler yeah. or Tyler Dukes? And, and so, you know, all of these pieces have existed. Mm -hmm. What Clearview has done is put them all together and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google, they're all saying this company has crossed the line. They've essentially gone out and grabbed all these photos from these uh, sites, um, violating their terms of use. So, but to be clear, not a legal line, more of an ethical line. I think that's accurate. Is that right? Right, okay. right. I mean, there, there's certainly some, you could make some claims about the fact that, you know, we might own the copyright to our own images and there's some, you know, things of, of that nature that, that can be discussed. But, you know, there's really, uh, this is uh, a bit of a, a Wild West scenario. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's kind of what brought us to um, these questions because, you know, we were all reading this story uh, I believe you and I even shared it over talked the weekend and we yeah. talked about it. And the, the question, um, because the thrust of the article was, you know, 600 plus law enforcement agencies across the country are using these. And they highlighted some here and yeah. there. So the question becomes, is it happening here? 
right? Exactly. Coming up in the next section, I want to hear about what exactly you found. All right, we're talking with Tyler Dukes today about facial recognition technology being used. Just to go back really quickly, Clearview, is it just one word and spelled like Clearview? I don't know why I need to picture it in my mind. Yeah, Clearview, one word, and, you know, it's Clearview AI, although it's used a lot of times in the marketing materials, is just Clearview. Clearview. I mean, I mean, just the, you know, connotation of that is like, oh, you know, you're getting a clear view of things, but it's so muddy what this is actually doing. So you, the New York Times article had that, did you say 600? Yeah, 600 plus law enforcement agencies that they were able to to get out of the company to, you know, essentially what the company had disclosed to them about how many uh, law enforcement agencies participate in the service. Got ya. So what did you do? So our, our first question was just to go to right in our backyard, the Raleigh Police Department. So we asked that question of them. Uh, Did you just ask Raleigh? uh, We asked a couple different uh, police agencies. Raleigh was the uh, first one that we found to disclose that they did, in fact, use Clearview, and Mm -hmm. that started the reporting process. So So when you asked them, did you do it through a just emailing the public information officer or was it like a – what would make this public information? I mean, obviously – yeah, this is a really great question because there's there's often this tension between what police departments want to release about their tactics and techniques, right? But when we're talking about the uh, a company uh, contracting with a, a public agency, that is public information. The contracts, how much they spent. Because um, it's taxpayer money. Exactly, exactly. So the disclosure of whether or not they have an existing contract or agreement or they've paid this company. Absolutely a spoke record. So so that started the conversation with an email. Okay. I have a random question, side note on that. What if it was paid for from a grant from a nonprofit? Would that make it different? Uh, not in my mind. Okay. Certainly. I mean, <laughs> you know, you you may you may argue, uh, may have an argument to make about whether or not that would be public information, but but it's you still know, a government entity. You know, in my view, if the if the government is creating documents, creating agreements, entering into contracts, uh, regardless of that agency, if they're if they're doing the public's business, mm-hmm. then the public deserves to know. Absolutely. Okay. So keep going. Did you? So you you sent this request to Raleigh, but you sent it to all like other police departments as well. Yeah, several other, and, and some are are still getting back to us. Some have already confirmed that they don't have any relationship mm-hmm. with this company, and so we're still trying to get a a, a good sort of census of of how uh, widespread this is used. Uh, and you know, pretty soon after we asked the question, they they did confirm Raleigh Police did confirm they used this, and it, you know that started the reporting process. So were we, you like? Whoa! Like, did you did you expect Raleigh to be using it? You know, it, Raleigh, the Raleigh Police Department is is surprising sometimes because I, you know Raleigh is a pretty big city, and yeah. you know, to be honest, you know, we have discovered in in past cases that that the police department here in in North Carolina's capital city has often been at the forefront of of embracing some of these technologies. That's interesting. So you know, while it was it was certainly interesting, it, I don't think it was terribly surprising yeah. because this this is they're pretty innovative. Yeah, I mean, I I think we've certainly seen them embrace some technology certainly before other agencies and, okay. and they've been on the forefront of that uh, so not terribly surprising so at this point you and I started talking about all right this is clearly a story how do we what was your next approach what did you start thinking about as far as what information you needed who you wanted to talk to what the implications were so there's this old saying that you know if you're a hammer everything's a nail right I mean it, it, the way my approach uh, typically starts is with a uh, records request and and that's kind of my first go-to thing so I I want you know what I asked for was correspondence contracts um, because I wanted to see not just a confirmation that we use this but you know what sorts of agreements have uh, has the department made how much money are they paying um, and oftentimes this correspondence back and forth can reveal some really interesting things. So you mean correspondence between anyone in RPD and the company? And the company, between exactly. Okay. So that's that was the next step. I asked for that uh, communication. Emails. And essentially emails in this case. And, you know, historically we might have said like memos or things. Like that. In this case, most of the time we're talking about emails. Okay. So – did you get them? Did they re- respond? I did, and then they uh, they provided um, uh, a couple. It ended up being about a hundred or so pages of, of emails, and it's you know less emails than that. But 
that those emails included the invoices from Clearview. They included marketing materials that Clearview had provided to um, the police department, um, which we could use in our reporting, and, and lots of other um, things that uh, prompted bigger questions mm-hmm. about how exactly this was being used and what the company was telling the police department about exactly how its program works. And who else knew that RPD was doing this? Exactly. Right? Because the threshold of, it was fairly cheap. Am I right? It was like 2500 Yeah, 2500 bucks, which, you know, you know, in the, in the scale of a police department is not a whole heck of a lot of money. And that's especially true if you compare it to what the Raleigh Police Department had used in the past. And we found that- Do you mean a facial recognition? facial recognition, exactly. So Raleigh Police Department has used facial recognition for years. So this is not terribly new. Okay. Um, What's new is the database with which they can now compare it. Exactly. And and actually what's interesting about the story too is that, you know, we, the New York Times' work, um, they worked with a a nonprofit out of Boston called Muckrock, Mm -hmm. which is uh, very, very much interested in generating public records requests and helping people do that. And, you know, they worked with that, that organization to send out requests to lots of different police agencies, including the Raleigh Police Department. Hmm. But it just so happened that the timing of their request to the Raleigh Police Department was before they signed the contract with or the, made the agreement with Clearview. So oh, they wow. did not capture any of that information. Okay. But they did capture the information for the past contract with a company called DataWorks, another facial recognition app that they used. Tell me about that. How, like, did had we reported on that, that they were using it? Was it in what ways did they use it? Do you know? Yeah. So, you know, the DataWorks is actually a, a, a pretty popular platform for lots of different uh, police agency applications and things like, you know, mugshot, you know, police displays and police reports and okay. all kinds of stuff. So and they have a facial recognition platform. That uses uh, mugshots from the City County Bureau of Identification in mm-hmm. Wake County. So these are people who were arrested and charged with crimes. Mm -hmm. So, again, we're talking about the size of that database being much, much smaller. So much smaller compared to three billion. Exactly. Um, And this sounds like a judgment, and I don't mean for it to, but it also seems like more fair. Like people have been in the system, and so they're compared, you know, it's the same system comparing against itself Mm -hmm. almost, not this whole outside data set. Well, and certainly you can argue that all of those photos were captured uh, by the public agency. That's true. Which, you know, has access to those and and they are in effect public documents. And I I think your question actually goes to the heart of what the the Raleigh's own facial recognition policy was. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about that. And when did when did that come about? I mean, when did one have to write a facial recognition policy? 2015. So. And one of the, th- the things we did, that, that facial recognition policy is online. Uh, Muckrock also had it. But, you know, one of the things we found in that policy was very clear um, that the Raleigh Police Department, you know, tried to put some guardrails on, you know, how it uses this, this program. So only a couple of different people, you know, the forensic analysis is, uh, analysts essentially can use it. And what they can compare it to is the database of mugshots from CCBI. And that was explicit in the policy. So that was their policy. If you're going to use facial recognition, it has to be with this information that's with data set. Is that? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so at that point, the story got a little bit more interesting because it, it, it turned from just they're using controversial technology to they're using controversial technology that potentially violates their own policy. Their own policy. And give me a timeline on this. How long had they been using this technology? How, when did the correspondence you got date back to? So they signed a contract with Clearview in August of 2019. Mm-hmm. And we started asking questions about this in late January. I believe it's probably January 20th or something okay. like that, right after the New York Times story mm-hmm. hit. Um, but they had been talking with them since June. Is that right? There was some correspondence uh, about before June that? June or July. And, and it's, it's a little bit unclear from the correspondence, but it, it appears that, you know, basically what had happened was, you know, either the company or the uh, the police agency had uh, connected at some point, probably offline. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then some conversations about, you know, how the technology works had started. And then at some point, somebody tried it and said, wow, this is great. OK, let's try to pay for it. Coming up, I want you to tell us about how you discovered that they've used it at least once.
All right, we're talking with Tyler Dukes about the facial recognition company Clearview that he found out Raleigh police had a contract with until very recently. One way that you also knew that RPD was using it is that they actually arrested somebody using it. Is that right? Yeah. And you found this from like promotional material. Yeah. And so this is why I think, you know, I love public records so much because you can typically find these really good gems that add, you know, some amazing context to the story. Now, we can't send a records request to Clearview. And in fact, right. we we asked Clearview for comment several times. We got no response from the company. But in the correspondence between the company and the police department, we found a big uh, package of marketing materials, success stories, essentially, of, of, you know, all these people that have been arrested Mm -hmm. um, as a result of using Clearview. And one of these cases was um, a uh, an arrest of a man named James Miro sometime mid 2019. Um, And the details of this are a little unclear. But in the marketing materials, there's actually clear view marketing material. Yeah, clear view marketing okay. material. But but in those materials, one of the things that they're actually doing is is quoting a Raleigh police detective saying that the use of this technology led to this arrest. Now, it's unclear who exactly used the technology. Raleigh police did not have an agreement with Clearview at that time. And Raleigh police says they did not use the technology to identify this man, but it's possible that there are a couple other agencies involved here, mm-hmm. including the U.S. Marshals. So there's some unanswered questions there about exactly who employed the technology to make the arrest. And it was just a couple months before they did have a contract, right? Exactly. So is it possible that they had like a, a demo test or something or that maybe that Clearview even did it for them to show them how it could work? That's what I suspected at the beginning. And in, in my conversations back and forth with the Raleigh Police Department's uh, press people, um, they basically said, you know, we didn't use it, uh, but we, we heard about it from um, that's how we heard about it. And so it's unclear exactly which agency used it. But, you know, what's interesting, in fact, is, you know, they they originally, the Raleigh Police Department originally denied that they had, you know, anything to do with the marketing materials that Clearview put out. Even though a detective was quoted in it. When I sent that to them and said, here is what they're saying. And also here's an email trail showing the detective talking with the company. They said he didn't intend for his uh, comments to be made in that marketing material and did not give his consent to use them. Wow, that's I'm really a bit more about that arrest that they made. We don't know a whole lot about how they got the facial recognition. What was the guy charged with? Uh, a slew of charges. So the uh, this guy in particular, he'd been in trouble with the law many times. Uh, he has been charged uh, with uh, financial crimes, um, stealing essentially more than $100,000 from uh, multiple victims. And uh, he also racked up uh, child pornography charges because oh, wow. when they caught him, he... Uh, allowed them to search his phone where they found uh, pornography on that uh, phone that they ended up uh, using also in subsequent charging documents. Wow. So um, he's awaiting trial. We've also reached out to his public defender who uh, has not gotten back with us. Okay. Um, okay. So at this point, you tell me who you talked with before you were set up to talk with Raleigh Police Department. Of course, you were working on this for what we decided was going to be an on-air story as well as obviously a bigger web story where we go more in-depth on everything. For a TV story, we often, you know, we need to have sound. We need to have people talking about the issues. So who would you talk to? So we had already talked to the uh, American Civil Liberties Union of North Carolina, which is aware of this company, and we had been communicating with them about some of the details we were learning, as well as some other privacy experts um, who've, who've sort of weighed in on, on past stories. Uh, that we've done here at the station. And yeah, I mean, our our intent was to explore um, this story a little bit more in depth. It wasn't just, hey, they're using it and right. that's news. And I think that is news. But I think one of the things we were trying to do is provide some broader context because mm-hmm. this is really, like I said, the Wild West. There's a lot of gray here. And so we wanted to make sure that people fully understood, um, you know, how this tech worked, um, what the benefits were, what the drawbacks were, what the critics were saying, and, you mm-hmm. know, and be able to sort of make their own mind about whether or not this is appropriate for police to use. Because it's literally affecting, whether they know it or not, every one of our viewers and, and users, right? I mean, if they've been tagged on social media, like they could be part of this, what their local police department is comparing to. Absolutely. And and there's there's always the possibility of false positives and, false, right. you know, and... And I, one privacy advocate had actually described it to me this way. It, it, she she said it was a little bit akin to sort of the classic lineup, uh, only this is a digital lineup where we're dragging everybody into the mm. room to compare, you know, and this facial recognition algorithm is comparing instead of just, you know, six men who might match the subject, it's 
you know, six million people every single time. And there, you know, in the classic sense of doing that physical lineup, there are guardrails that exist that prevent abuse by police. Mm -hmm. None of those guardrails exist in this scenario because, again, it's a really gray area. Yeah. Um, and I think you make a good point there that we're I feel like we're sort of talking about it negatively. But it's, you know, the purpose, of course, is to protect people. It's to whoever lost the, the hundred thousand dollars, those victims. This guy got arrested because they found it. So it's that line between safety or security or policing and privacy. Yeah, yeah. And and it's and it's a really, I mean, it, I think it's a really interesting conversation because you know there there absolutely are at least if you look at these marketing materials and 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 accept them for what they are, right? It certainly seems like this can work. Right. This can benefit police, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know. What's missing from the marketing materials are the people who are wrongfully arrested, wrongfully identified, right. um, you know, targeted or, you know, the conversations about why people of color are routinely misidentified in, in facial recognition really? um, across, you know, whether whatever the technology is. Hmm. Um, and and so you don't see that in the marketing materials, but that not. absolutely needs to be part of the conversation. Because, look, we, we have, again, these rules to prevent abuse in the sort of classic physical space. Like there's a reason why police just can't, you know, search whatever they'd like to search. They have to go get a warrant. They have to prove probable cause. These are, you know, steps that society has decided are important to provide a check mm -hmm. uh, while still allowing police to do their jobs. You know, with when, the RPD had done with its policy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and what you and what you're seeing now is, you know, this conversation about you know, the the possibility that, you know, those same checks in the digital space just aren't as robust as they need to be. Yeah. So interesting. OK, let's move forward with how our story unfolded. Um, you were scheduled is this Monday. This would have been Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. You we were surprised. RPD said, yep, we'll let you talk to somebody. We had an interview set up for two o'clock, I think, the afternoon. It was in the morning. Yeah. It was oh, it's going to be in the morning, 10. You're right. Yeah. Sorry. And we had set this up actually um, uh, the previous week. And, you know, I, I've been going back and forth with the spokespeople because I, you know, have very, what I feel to be very legitimate questions about right. the use of this, this uh, service and how it, uh, how it interacts with policy. And you had I, emailed questions to I them. Had, I, they had requested, and I don't love to do this, but I, I, had sent, I, I had sent a bunch of questions that sort of outlined my broad, um, you know, concerns and, and questions for them uh, about a week prior. And they said, OK, well, we'll sit you down with uh, Sergeant Chuck Penny, who's the head of the intelligence center in Raleigh. So mm -hmm. he and he's the guy who's sort of the point person mm -hmm. in all these emails. Right. Uh, so we have that scheduled um, uh, several days. Weekend passes. Yeah. Uh, Monday night, I, I send a reminder email to the spokesperson like, hey, you know, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Here's our photographer. You know, we're, we're set up. And about 6.30, I get an email from- 6.30 the, Tuesday morning. 6.30 6 6 p.m. on Monday okay. night. Okay. Um, after I had essentially gone home for the day saying, we're no longer using Clearview. Uh, we are reviewing our policy on facial recognition. Therefore, we no longer need to do this interview. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, this kind of came, this was super surprising. It was. And it really it really moved our timeline up because, again, did. you know, we had not planned to we wanted to do a full look on this. And, yeah. and you know, we were going to air until next week. Right. Right. And so we really, uh, you know, the next morning um, got in and uh, pushed to get this out because, you know, this is a this is a pretty major policy change and a, and a major change in how the, the department seemed to be operating. And clearly we cannot say that this change was brought about by anything we did. But the timing is certainly interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. I mean, what they're saying is that they routinely, you know, audit, you know, their practices. They're six months into their one year agreement with Clearview. They have also said that they typically don't audit anything until about a year into it. So you can read into that mm -hmm. what you'd like to read into it. Um, but, you know, a couple of things. One, you know, the New York Times story was uh, was big and a lot right. of people read that. And Absolutely. it's totally possible that that was one of the the. Um, the catalyst for mm -hmm. this. But, you know, we also had started asking questions almost uh, immediately as as before um, they uh, started communicating with the company mm -hmm. saying, we're being asked by the media how many times we've done searches. How might we find that out? 
Oh, that's super interesting. So they didn't know. They didn't. Whatever access is given to them, it doesn't show how many times it's been accessed. Apparently. Or at least they didn't know how to do it. And, and, so, and you got this from correspondence since then? Today. Oh, wow. Yeah, I so, haven't heard this. Right, because we had a, um, we actually had a, uh, they issued a press release on Tuesday night after we had um Yeah, had, let's go back to story. Tuesday. Yeah, sure. So, you know, you come in that morning and you're like, well, it's off. And we, we sort of, you know, explode from there. Um, I have a manager's meeting every morning at 845. And when I told them what had happened, you know, I'd been telling them about the story that you were doing. When I told them what had transpired overnight, everybody was like, whoa, this is big. So we actually partnered you with Amanda Lamb, who has been a longtime crime and police beat reporter here, you know, decades. And um, you guys have worked together in the past some, but, you know, y'all kind of move forward on this. Um, tell me kind of what the what developed through the day. Yeah, sure. So Amanda Lamb, of course, you know, expert in cops and courts right. in this area. And, and there's there's few better reporters uh, on that on that beat here. Uh, and so our task, you know, essentially ran on parallel tracks at that point. It was, you know, her producing the piece for um, several shows throughout the day that aired on television. And my job sort of support some of the work she was doing and also do what as best we could do, the most in-depth piece we could provide on what happened up until that point in time. Uh, on, on a Tuesday deadline. morning, <laughs> on deadline, and we really wanted to get this out because we wanted people to be able to know this. Again, this is a significant change, and right. so you know we did not feel like waiting until next week would right. be. This uh, is the no right longer piece. a hold piece. Exactly. In fact, we had a different producer producing the noon news that day, and I went up to him and I was like, "Scott, this is you know this can be your twelve or twelve thirty lead," and he's like, oh, "The New York Times did a story about that," yeah. and we're like, "We know." Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, this did feel significant in the newsroom. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, was, it really was. And I think, um, you know, whether or not we, you know, prompted the change, I think, you, you know, it, it is easy to see how significant this change was, that clearly the, the Raleigh Police Department was using this technology and maybe had not asked the right questions up until this point, whether that was uh, prompted by internal, external pressures, we don't exactly know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, clearly they reevaluated their process here. Okay, so just quickly, what what happens moving forward? Do we know where this stands? The contract is ended. It's not like it's suspended. Yeah, and so and this is a kind of sort of an interesting thing. Like normally, when we think about you know uh, striking up an agreement with a technology company, you sign a contract, you you pay money. Uh, with Clearview, it, it's such a low dollar amount. At least in the records that they provided, there's no actual contract. They just oh, signed up like we would sign up for like a meal service on wow. you know online. So, and, and so, to, just real quick, twenty five hundred per year. Twenty five hundred per year, and remember, so we're small. six months into that contract. So, what Raleigh, the Raleigh Police Department has said is that they're no longer using it. They they do not plan to continue using it. So it wasn't like breaking a contract. They just they just, just stopped. Okay. Yeah, and in the, in the meantime, they are reevaluating their facial recognition policy in light of you know some of the new technology that's out there. Which makes sense because it's five years old and technology. It was much more quickly than that. Right. Thank you so much, Tyler. This is so interesting. I know it's a story that you're going to continue to follow. And um, next week, you also have a story coming out about another question about the line between safety and privacy. Yeah. Um, so everybody can tune into WRAL Monday to, to see that at 615. Thank you so much, Tyler. Thanks for having me. For other shows in the Capital Broadcasting Podcast Network, just search podcast at WRAL.com. There you'll also find contact information where you can send us feedback or ideas you have for future podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>